familiar, shall we? So you've had that telescope you found at a yard sale sitting around the house for years, and all of a sudden there's a major astronomical event that you want to use it for. But there's only one question. How in the world do you even use that telescope? What gives? Before we get to the telescope itself, you'll obviously need something to put it on. So let's talk mounts. Now there are two main types. The first one is altitude and azimuth mounts. And I'm going to have to talk a little bit about coordinates here, but they're not super important to actually being able to use a telescope, so don't get too worried. Altitude is your height on the horizon from 0 to 90 degrees, 90 degrees being directly above you, and this is also called your zenith. And azimuth is your rotation around the horizon, it's measured in degrees from 0 to 360, starting due north. Aside from the basic tripod style of alt azimuth mount, you can also have Dobsonians, which are a sort of Lazy Susan style mount, you push to look at your target. And you can also have computerized all azimuth mounts. And after a star alignment, these can automatically go to a target of your choice, which makes them pretty nice for visual use since they can also roughly follow your target. But they lack any capability for astrophotography due to field rotation. The second main type of telescope mount is called an equatorial mount. These have the ability to rotate at the same rate and angle as a target moves across the sky, allowing you to keep the target in the center of the eyepiece. Now these are a little less intuitive to use and I'll tell you why. In order to track the movement of the sky, the whole mount is tilted so that its axis of rotation is aligned with the North Celestial Pole. That's really close to the North Star Polaris. This tilt means that we use a different coordinate system than an alt azimuth mount, which is where things can get confusing. That coordinate system is right ascension and declination. Instead of being a local coordinate system like altitude and azimuth, Right Ascension and Declination uses the Celestial Sphere. That way, wherever you are on the planet, the coordinates are the same. Right Ascension is the axis of the mount from east to west as it follows the movement of the sky, and Declination is the axis from north to south on the Celestial Sphere. This is all while still on that tilt to keep the Right Ascension axis rotating around the North Celestial Pole. Oh yeah! The only reason this works at all is because the Earth is round, so uh... Checkmate, Flat Earthers. Setting up an equatorial mount can be tricky since it requires polar aligning, so I made a guide on how to do that. I'll have it linked in the video. If you don't have a polar scope on your EQ mount, and it's as simple as pointing the right ascension axis north and setting your altitude adjustment to your latitude, and that should get you close enough for a rough alignment. There are a few types of equatorial mounts. Some are simply manual mounts with slow motion controls so that you can follow your target. Others have motor drives for the right ascension axis that lets them out keep your target centered automatically once you find it. But if you're lucky enough to have a computerized equatorial mount, then once you're polar aligned, check that your time, date, location, and all that's input correctly. All you have to do is a star alignment using your hand controller, and then you can instruct the mount to go to whatever target you choose. Instructions on how to do all this can vary, so it's best to check your manual. Now we can talk about the actual telescope, and we'll need to go over some specs first. Your OTA, or optical tube assembly, that's the fancy name for a telescope, it has three important factors. And the most important one is your primary objective. That's the main lens or mirror that gathers incoming light. And a larger primary usually means you can gather more detail, and it allows you to see fainter objects. Telescopes are often referred to as light buckets. That's because they function much like a bucket in the rain. The larger your bucket is, the more water you can collect. Same goes for telescopes. The larger your objective, the more light you can gather to see fainter objects. The second of these factors is your focal length. Your focal length is the physical distance light travels from the primary objective to the point where the image is formed. It plays a part in the final magnification and field of view you get from your telescope. Higher focal length generally means you get a more close-up image. And lastly, we have aperture. When talking about telescopes, aperture is just the physical diameter of the primary objective. It's usually measured in millimeters or inches. It's time to get into some telescope anatomy. There are three main types of telescopes we're going to go over. First is refractors. They're the simplest form of telescope. They use lenses as their optics. Higher quality versions such as triplet refractors can be amazing for astrophotography or observing. 
but they get very expensive very quickly as aperture increases, which usually keeps people from using them for observing. Yard sale finds aren't likely to be great for anything besides moon watching due to chromatic aberration as the optics can't focus light quite properly. The second type of telescope is Newtonian, or NUT for short. These are the most common design for visual astronomy. They use a primary and secondary mirror instead of lenses. They're usually a better value for visual use due to larger apertures being available for relatively little cost. The one drawback they have is they require collimation from time to time, which is the process of aligning mirrors to ensure a sharp image. That may sound difficult, but it's actually pretty easy to master. It's done by simply adjusting the bolts on the primary and secondary mirror, while using a tool such as a laser collimator or a collimation eyepiece to fine tune your alignment. The last type of telescope I'm going to talk about are compound telescopes. That covers a variety of designs, but they all use a combination of mirrors and lenses. They're quite compact for their focal length since they bounce the light around more than a standard Newtonian and can be amazing for viewing planets, distant galaxies, and more. Another bonus is they don't need to be collimated as often as newts, if at all. Now you're ready to learn how to use the telescope itself. So the first part of the scope you'll have to use is the focuser. It moves the eyepiece in and out of the telescope in order to bring the incoming light into perfect focus to create an image. There's no autofocusing at night unless you get deep into astrophotography, so you'll have to do this manually. It's best to practice during the daytime on a distant object such as a tree or a street light. Find the focuser on your scope and turn the focus knob slowly while looking through the eyepiece until the image appears as clear and sharp as possible. Some scopes even have slow motion controls to allow even further fine tuning. If you're using a star to focus, try and make it appear as small and bright as possible. It should look like a pinpoint of light. Having your focus right is very important to getting a clear view of what you're looking at. So even once you've found your target, it's a good idea to play around with your focus. Another super important part of a visual telescope is the finder scope. A finder scope is like a miniature telescope. It gives you a wider field of view, similar to binoculars, that makes it a lot easier to find what you're looking for, whether that's through star hopping or eyeballing your position. You aren't going to have an easy time finding anything in the night sky if you don't align your finder scope with your actual telescope so they're pointing at the same thing. Again, it's easiest to do this during daylight and hope you don't bump it out of alignment by the time it gets dark. Start by finding something very far away to point your telescope at. If it's too close, your alignment won't be very accurate. Center that object in the finder, then check if you can see it through the telescope eyepiece. You'll likely need to move your telescope some. Once you have it centered in the eyepiece, check your finder again, and then use the thumb screws on the finder to adjust it until the view is centered on the same object that your telescope is. If it's already dark, the moon might be a good option for alignment. Try doing your alignment on a recognizable crater. Your telescope should have come with one or multiple eyepieces. You'll notice they have little numbers on them. This is the focal length of the eyepiece, which can tell you how much it magnifies the image by. Simply divide your telescope focal length by the eyepieces, and that'll give you your magnification. For example, if my telescope has 1000 millimeters of focal length, and I'm using a 25 millimeter eyepiece, that gives me 40 times magnification. Simply put, an eyepiece with a higher number will be less zoomed in than one with a lower number. When learning the night sky, a planetarium app or program is incredibly useful to help you find what you're looking for. If your phone has an internal compass and gyroscope, which most do these days, you can even use it to point at the sky and see roughly what you're looking at. And having a star chart in your hand makes star hopping way easier. My favorite of these to use is Sky Safari, due to it being highly customizable. The first step to using your telescope is to get a rough focus. A distant street light, bright planet, or the moon can be used to get a roughly accurate focus. It could be helpful to make a mark on your scope to aid in focusing in the dark. Next, unlock your chokes. Both alt azimuth and equatorial mounts have chokes to keep the scope locked in place while observing, but they need to be loosened so that you can move your scope to your target. In order to find your target, you'll need to do something called star hopping. That's the easiest way to find what you're looking for in the night sky. To star hop, you use bright or recognizable stars as guides to finding your target. Knowing the relative positions of bright stars and target objects is important, so Sky Safari or any sort of star map will be very helpful. After planning the star hop with the aid of a star chart, 
First, locate one or more bright stars in your finder scope, or at a low magnification through the eyepiece of your telescope. Then move your scope by one or more increments to follow the patterns of stars in the sky until you reach your target. Once you've found what you're looking for, use your slow motion focus knob if you have one to move your focus back and forth little by little while looking through your eyepiece to fine tune your image. Remember, you're trying to make it look as sharp as possible. Keeping your expectations somewhat low is important for visual astronomy. Not because what you're going to see isn't amazing, but because light pollution, human eyesight, and other factors have a major impact on what you can see. If the background sky is brighter than what you're trying to observe, you aren't going to have much luck. And our eyes aren't nearly as powerful as cameras for capturing the incredible colors and details that you see in pictures of galaxies and nebulae. Galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters will appear to the eye as fuzzy, faintly glowing blobs. And while planets aren't affected by light pollution, they could be amazingly detailed or nothing more than smudgy blobs. It all depends on the turbulence of the atmosphere and the optical quality of your telescope. You can imagine it as trying to see an object at the bottom of the deep end of the pool, that will give you an idea of what looking through miles of atmosphere does to planetary views. Well, I hope all of this has been helpful. If you're just starting out and looking for some deep sky objects to try observing, check out the Great Orion Nebula and the Andromeda Galaxy. Those two never disappoint. If there's anything I missed, leave a comment and I'll do my best to get back to you. If you'd like to see more videos like this, definitely get subscribed. And thanks for watching. Clear skies, everyone.